This is a story about today that started yesterday and impacts tomorrow. Hi, I'm Nancy Pelosi, lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. And I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. We don't always see eye to eye. But we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. Together, we can do this. We couldn't be further apart. I'm on the left. And I'm usually right. And we strongly disagree. Except on one issue. Tell them what it is, Reverend Pat. That would be our planet. Taking care of it is extremely important. We all need to work together, liberals and conservatives. Mark Twain was reported to have said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. In the 1960s, auto and industry pollution got so bad that Republican President Richard Nixon established the Environmental Protection Agency and signed the Clean Air Act. And then a lot of things happened. Energy wars, culture wars, policy wars, and then came the scientists with proof that the planet is warming. And yet... Is climate change a fact? No. No. No, God because of climate. No. So the Religion, Race, and Democracy Lab at the University of Virginia asked the question, when did climate change go from a scientific metric to a political hot potato? And what does God have to do with it? Here's what a few people had to say. Clearly, climate change was identified, uh, culturally marked as a left-right issue. And so I said that climate change was nonsense. Uh, I didn't know anything about it except that Al Gore was for it. And uh, inasmuch as I represented a very conservative district in South Carolina, that was the end of the inquiry for me. We have gotten to such a toxic point where we don't even stop to listen to what somebody is saying. Once we know what team they're on, it's like, oh, psh, can't listen to you. When a conservative says the phrase property rights, what the environmentalist hears is destruction. And when an environmentalist says protect the earth, the conservative Christian hears bureaucracy, uh, regulations. That's why when I, when I uh, embrace creation stewardship as a Christian, people say, well, what happened to you? You know, have you been drinking lefty Kool-Aid? I earned my spurs for many years as a conservative, a faithful conservative. I came to work for the National Association of Evangelicals at the start of the religious rights rise in American politics. It was 1980, Ronald Reagan was president. I worked there for a total of 28 years, and so I saw the shift from evangelicals and fundamentalists being not involved in politics, non-engaged, to being hyper-engaged. When I was invited to the Climate Change Conference at Oxford in 2002, I accepted. But I said, don't expect me to change my mind, don't expect me to sign any statements. But then he came back and he bought a Prius. The point is, I had a conversion. There's no other way to describe it. He took the position that the Bible says man must care for the earth. But even worse, he went on NPR and said, I would willingly say I believe in civil unions. Ten days later, he was fired. Climate change is not science. It's religion. We hear from Christian evangelists even today that, well, we don't need to listen to scientists on climate. You meld that with a biblical fundamentalism that is a bit rigid, and you have together a noxious brew. I think that there is an unholy alliance that formed between the leaders of what passed as the moral majority, let's say, and some people with some very specific economic interest when it comes to climate change. When you allow your faith to be used by people with economic interest, 
Wow, does it get corrupted pretty quickly. For me, one of the starting places has got to be, how did we get ourselves into this mess? We've got to look at our history and understand of how we've gotten here. The racism that has caused some people to be hurt so much more than others. African Americans in this country breathe air that's 50% more polluted than non-African Americans. If we don't tackle that, we'll just be putting band-aids on top of a pussy and ugly wound. Right at the beginning of environmentalism, let's say the 1960s, evangelicals were okay with it. Even Francis Schaeffer, famous for his anti-abortion crusade, was on board. One of his first texts is on pollution. Francis Schaeffer comes along and writes this book and says, we are, as evangelicals, concerned about pollution, but we never must lose sight of the Christian roots of our environmental concern that man needed to be privileged over nature. At this early stage, there was enough synchronicity for evangelicals to support the movement. This changes by the end of the 70s. The story about how evangelicals came into power is about taxes, actually, taxes and race. Evangelicals masked behind Bob Jones University when it was pressed to integrate the school and allow interracial dating in the 1970s. When the IRS came after Bob Jones, evangelicals got very upset about this. Bob Jones University hired lawyers. They took their case to the Supreme Court and said, All of the policies followed by the university are obligatory upon the university as dictated by scripture. The Supreme Court did not agree. When they had their tax exemption stripped, evangelicals began to write in they were upset, you know, starting to come into the space of anti-abortion activism and also the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. And gay rights, and before long, the planet's rights. The environment and environmentalism as an ism was understood to be a worldview uh, devoid of God and his creative purposes and his imminence in creation. The solutions put forward by environmentalism were perceived to be a threat or contrary to Christian values. But there are other issues as well in the 1970s, and I argue that we need to remember them as well. The energy crisis. As far as oilmen in the Southwest are concerned, the reason why America is going to suffer in those energy crises is because they have ceded power, ceded control of oil to foreign powers, such as Saudi Arabia, such as OPEC countries. And so they seized on the phrase, America first. Sound familiar? America first. And these independent oilmen of the Southwest wrap these, all these issues all together uh, and bundle them in, by 1979, an anti-Jimmy Carter, pro-Reagan movement. Reagan goes on to champion domestic fuel and family values and wins. Reagan is defending the rights and the freedoms of independent oilmen across the Southwest to drill, drill, drill. The fact is, the oil industry has been in an epic battle with itself to control America's political and ideological landscape since oil was first discovered. On one side, big oil pushing their brand of American Protestantism. Which I call kind of the civil religion of crude. That is the opposite of wildcat Christianity. The religious, political, economic culture of these small oil producers. Pushing their brand of evangelical Christianity. Well, on the civil religion of crude side, we have, of course, one family that absolutely dominates, and it's multiple generations, four generations. The Rockefellers. The oil empire begins with John Sr. in the late 1800s. By the 1890s, Standard Oil controls upwards of 90% of oil refining around the globe. By John Jr.'s time, the family is loaded, so he becomes a philanthropist. Perhaps the leading philanthropist in America at that time. But a philanthropist pouring profits into the Rockefeller Foundation. 
supporting missionaries, supporting liberal Protestant causes around the globe, extending kind of the Rockefeller vision of ecumenical religion and internationalist, democratic, progressive politics. By the 1970s and 80s, the fourth generation of the Rockefellers have in fact begun to use the Rockefeller money to support environmental and other progressive causes around the world. On the other side, this kind of the wildcat Christianity, uh, rooted again also in the early stages of oil in Pennsylvania, uh, families such as the Stewarts. The Stewarts of Union Oil poured their profits into evangelizing America all the way to his death in the early 1920s. Lyman Stewart will be really the most important, most powerful funder of fundamentalist Christianity, of wildcat Christianity. Lyman starts a church, funds missionaries, and builds a conservative Christian college. The notion too, deeply rooted in the oil patch and in the churches of the oil patch, that oil is God-given. This is a good thing, a divine blessing on America. The next Wildcat oil family to fuel the cause was the Pews. J. Howard Pew will have his own charitable trust that will be absolutely essential to the rise of the evangelical and political conservatism uh, in the 1940s and beyond. Oil is always in motion. You're always chasing the next frontier, be it the untapped soil or unsaved souls. When J. Howard Pugh passes away, the mantle is passed to the Hunt family, especially Bunker Hunt, who uses his family's oil money in the late 70s and 1980s to help support uh, several religious right causes. Evangelicals are very effective in, in changing the dial politically because they were very media savvy. They knew how to grab a headline. They had networks. There was also oil money being put into some of these organizations. Including the Cornwall Alliance, a group of Christian right theologians and scholars who said, environmentalism is one of the greatest threats to society and the church today. They tell us that the environmentalist movement is actually unbiblical, and they produce that DVD series, Resisting the Green Dragon, a biblical response to one of the greatest deceptions of our day. Resisting the Green Dragon cast environmentalism as this threat to the Christian worldview, as, as an idolatrous worldview that was infiltrating churches and had to be resisted. The idea is for pastors to create teams of congregants that will, as they describe it, advance kingdom values in the public arena. And then they give them tools to create messaging materials to devote their so-called biblical values. A lot of folks look at this term dominion that's in Genesis. And basically, people have interpreted it that some people have a right to be on top, a right to be on top of everything. That's what white supremacy is. The belief you have, a God-given often, right to be on top. They don't necessarily think about if we're coal mining, that's stripping out the earth, that is making um, things horrible for people, it's making the environment terrible. They believe God will come down and have this great battle with his angels, renew the earth, beat the devil, and then there will be a new heavens and a new earth. There's been this tension uh, for centuries between science and religion. You could go back to the 19th century and begin to talk about how Darwin's theory of evolution really confronted evangelicals. There were these two major camps uh, within the U.S. church. The modernists, who believed that the, the teaching of evolution could be consistent with the teachings of the Bible, and the fundamentalists, who said this is a bridge too far. And that kind of culminated in the early 20th century with the, the Scopes Monkey Trial. A, a teacher in Tennessee was taken to trial for teaching evolution. During this very public trial, William Jennings Bryan famously won the case for the fundamentalists, and the teacher was told to knock it off. But in the court of public opinion, the fundamentalists were kind of laughed into oblivion. But they didn't disappear. They invested in institutions and have come back in later years in the form of um, a resurgent modern evangelical movement. Just imagine if the moral majority had said, you know what, we think God created the earth and it's his, 
and we're going to dedicate ourselves afresh and anew to taking care of it, which means we're going to start um, uh, pushing for compost instead of chemicals. And the fact is that factory farming, it pollutes the ground, it disrespects the chicken, it, it stinks up the neighborhood. Everything about it is, is terrible, is against being a good neighbor. So we're going to start buying from local farmers. We want to have a, be connected to our food. We want to, you know, you can see the narrative. You would think that evangelicals would be involved with environmentalism. After all, this is part of God's creation. But for evangelicals, there was a sense in which this whole push for environmentalism was about liberalism. It just became a, a, a tribally marked thing. Uh, that, uh, you know, liberals are for action on climate, we're conservatives, we don't talk about that. For my first six years in Congress, I said that climate change was nonsense. Then I had the opportunity to run for the same seat again, and uh, my son came to me. He said to me, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. He went to Antarctica in search of evidence. He found it. And then he went to Australia and witnessed the Great Barrier Reef turning white. Denial was no longer an option. So I came home and introduced the Raise Wages Cut Carbon Act of 2009. When it didn't go well at all, after 12 years in Congress, I got 29% of the vote in a Republican runoff, and the other guy got the other 71% of the vote. Uh, a rather spectacular face plant uh, in politics. I believe Bob was a, a pioneer and a visionary and a, a trailblazer. I think his story may have been a cautionary tale when it happened in 2010. I don't think it is anymore. A lot of those religious right leaders that took exception to my advocacy are gone, gone to meet their creator. And, and yet there is a whole new generation of the young evangelicals for climate action Millennials and Generation Z behind them kind of recognize the danger of marrying their religious commitments with a particular political agenda. They're thinking more deeply about how does my faith inform my politics rather than how does my politics inform my faith. Young people are rising up and speaking truth and naming what's happening. I think the same thing may happen in greater portion within the church. I think young people are gonna rise up calling for something different. I think the original sin was both a violation of the environmental creation, but also a violation of some of the other members of our same species who we did not treat with dignity. If we want to shift I don't think we can choose either emissions and environmental shift or social justice and relief for the poor. That's one of the things I love about Pope Francis, is that he says these two things, they come from the same root. They must be addressed together. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. Each and every one of us must cherish this planet, for it is likely the only home we will ever know. Combating climate change is not a Democratic or Republican issue. It is the question of preserving this little piece of real estate that we call Earth for generations yet unborn.